Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to you. You're watching another episode of Encounter. Today in the studio of the NBC, we have Mega Venkita Swami, who is a meta coach. You're also a certified yoga teacher, and you are a woman circle facilitator. You're here today because we will speak about the women circle. It's a new terminology for me. Yeah. I know that circle is a shape, but yeah. what is women circle, Mega? First and foremost, welcome and thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. Tell us, what is the women's circle? A circle is the most fundamental and basic structure that is not even man-made. Like if you look, go back and look into nature, circles appear very naturally and automatically. Right now, you and me, we are a circle. Now, people watching us might find this weird because we are like sitting far apart and how come we are a circle? The fundamental in a circle is you are here, I'm here, you don't know better, I don't know better, but there's something happening between you and me, there's an exchange. And if we go back to indigenous cultures and how, even in India, in Africa, in even many parts of America, what we will see, there was this very innate and intuitive way of coming together of the community. Like even when I, I use my arms, the natural way of movement is always this. And what does okay. it even mean? is we come together and from that space of coming together, a lot of things happen. And this is what the, a lot of things we're going to talk about, what I do in my circles. So you do a lot of coaching in terms of uh, women's circle. Yeah. Is that a new term or has it always existed? Circle have always existed. So there's nothing new to women gathering. Okay. There's nothing new to women sitting together. There's nothing new to uh, women building communities. But I will say, and it's been on the move and rise for the last, probably last couple of 10 years, there is a need of going home. And when you sit in a circle, home is your body. Home, home is nowhere else. Okay. So when you sit together in a circle, and that's, that's the beauty of the work, and that's how I end up being there, and that's how I end up doing what I do today, is when you sit in a circle as a woman, you're sitting with your mess and your glory, and you're sitting next to another woman and another woman and many other women facing you. Now, how do you show up with a mess and glory? That's one of the biggest challenge. How did teaching about women's circle come up to you? Do you have your own story? Is it something you always wanted to learn or have you gone through things in life that okay. led you onto okay. this path? Now, first thing I want to really put forth is in women's circle, there is no teaching. I'm a facilitator, which okay. means that when I step there and I sit there as a facilitator, I'm just holding space. And what holding space means is you may show up in your anxiety, in your panic. I've been walking on such a path that I'm not going to get you out of your anxiety and your panic. And this is what we need as community, is when somebody shows up and is freaking out, instead of telling them, it's okay, it's okay, it's going to be right, this is not what that person needs. Let them show up in their anxiety and panic and I hold space. I feel like we as humanity, we move in a space where we don't want to even rest on esoteric and unseen and unwritten words. We want hard proven facts. Yeah, science. And it's, it's, it's not even controlled by the mind. It's the body. The body feels it. That's why a child will know when she wants to be touched or not. Like she likes this uncle, she doesn't like this other man. And it's all about moving in a space of grounding and easing and calming. And that's what circles do fundamentally. Now, how did I end up there? It's my own journey as a woman. I've had my share of wound, of pain, but I've asked any woman on this plane, on this earth, I've had my share of trauma. Like a lot of women, we say they were never traumatized. If we start digging deeper, we all have our share of trauma. If it's not mine, it's transgenerational, I've inherited. So as I went on that path of saying like, I want to do something with my own life. I went on what we call a wom my own woman's spirituality journey. And for any woman, growth is very symbolic to dying. Like if you ask any woman who is in pain, she'll literally tell you like, she's being open, teared wide open, and she's dying, and she can't explain what's happening. And that's a journey of a woman. That's how women evolve on this plane. We evolve by constantly going through that wave of dying, and then coming out, and dying, and coming out. So I've had my journey, I'm still on that journey. All right, that's very interesting. Mega, we'll just have a look at this small report, and we'll invite the viewers also to have a look. 
uh, to have a little bit more details about what is uh, Women's Circle. Women's circles create safe spaces to allow women to move inwards, to see, feel, heal and listen to their stories, beliefs, values, wounds, woundedness, connectedness, disconnectedness, relationships, life and the world. Women's circles teach women to embrace both their light and shadow selves. Women gathering moves women in spaces to reclaim their stories and cast spells onto their selves so that they rise to reconciliate with this world. This is the power of circles. This is the power of words. This is the power of consciously crafting and sealing agreements with and within themselves and the external world. So, who should attend these circles? It is women aged 18 years onwards, regardless of religious beliefs and group of belonging and sexual orientation. Each women's circle is run on a predetermined theme with a set schedule and activities. The objective is to get the women, as well as the facilitators, to experience hands-on tools which they can use back home to further their way through life. As John O'Donoghue quotes, a blessing is a circle of light drawn around a person to protect, heal and strengthen. Welcome back. We still have Mega with us in the studio. You mentioned something very interesting earlier, which yeah. is uh, attachment or trauma. Yeah. Can you give us an example how that happens and how you deal with it? Yeah. So let's say um, when a child is born, like a baby, the basic is survival. So the child can't survive on his or her own. You need to feed him, keep him warm, keep her warm and take care. So this ba fundamental need to survive is very prominent with a child. Now the child grows up, there are more needs that shows up, like the need to be held, to be cared, to be nurtured, to be taken care of. Feeding a child isn't enough. Yes. Showing up for a child, like a child shows up and is afraid, a child is crying for whatever reason, like being present for that child and then starting to regulate with a child, like rocking that child, even telling your child, oh, you're afraid, I see you're afraid, let me come with you and hold you. So if a child, like most of us, I will say, I, like we might even say all of us here on the studio, we haven't had this. Nobody has told us as a child, it's okay to be afraid. You're afraid? That's mm -hmm. fine. You're angry? That's fine. You're going to be fine after you're angry. You want to cry? Go ahead and cry. You're going to be fine. And what, when an adult does that, it's called co-regulating with a child. So as a child, when you learn that, when you grow into adulthood, then you will, when you actually start getting angry and frustrated and irritated, then you know, you've, you were given healthy beginning cues from the beginning of your life. You're going to use that and now you self-regulate, which means you're aware of your emotion, you use that. Now what happens as a child if you don't have this? What do you do as a child? Well, you tend to, to block yourself out you or me, you reassure exactly, yourself. Exactly. You, you'll numb it down. You'll numb it down because you want to survive. Yeah. You'll numb it down because if you start being who you are naturally, you have already understand that. I will not be able to belong to my family. So from a very tender age, majority of us, we have this message of, if you are being you, if you're going to be you, we're going to reject you. So for a child to survive, he or she is not going to jeopardize at any cost, the cost of belonging to the family. And I feel as we age, that's the biggest struggle we have. And I can say it for women especially, but I know the same applies to men which is why we reach a point in our life and it is big crisis. I don't know who I am. You don't know who you are because you blended to be something else because you don't want to not belong. What I understand is they maintain this way of living until they grow up, but when they grow up, this does not help them anymore. Exactly. And I think we were speaking about that earlier. What begins us coping becomes dysfunction. Okay. Let's, say, let's take the simple example. What does depression mean? Depression, depression means deep, I'm depressing something. That's what depression means. There's okay. something happening here, I'm depressing it, I'm pushing it down. Okay. So what will a child do when a child feels pain? He, she or he will just put it away because it's too hard to feel it and I will, I will find my own way to cope with it. And when we go into adulthood, we keep doing that, pushing stuff down, 
This is where dysfunction happens. Then the, just the inability of showing up, of saying, you know what, I'm hurting. I'm not keeping well. Now ask yourself, how many men are able to even show up and say, hey man, this is hurting me. I okay. can't handle it. So it comes down to not ha also having effective communication or having a space to freely express themselves? To feeling safe. And this is, what, this is what I do in my work as a circle facilitator. I cost, I provide, I nurture, and I maintain a safe space so that when you show up, you are you. You don't have to be anything else, anybody else. You can be as messy as you are. You can be as masky, mm -hmm. tying your mask. It's your choice, but you show up and here you're safe. And this is also the beauty of being a woman, because I, and I'm sure any woman who will listen will resonate with that. Ask any woman, she will tell you like she knows when it is safe, her body speaks of safety. Your body says it. Okay. There's an intelligence in this body. That's only for women? Uh, it is also for men, no okay. doubt, it's the same. But I, I'm saying it because I'm a woman born in a woman's body. Of course. That's where my conversation is. All right. Let's say uh, I suffer from attachment trauma. How do you probably help this person at the age of 15, 20, 25, 30, 35? How do you deal with the situation? Now, it's interesting what you said. You said you suffer from attachment trauma. From what you explained? Yeah, but the first thing is that we don't, I'm not going to even use that word, you're suffering from attachment trauma. That's the first thing. The okay. second thing we're going to use, and I feel it's very important when we speak of trauma or pain or anxiety or anything, this is what you're experiencing. This is not you. Just the ability of being able to say, I'm anxious, I'm panicked, I'm trembling, I'm shaking, this is not you. Because you're able to observe it, you're able to see it. So what we do if you show up with me and this is what you're experiencing right now, right? I'm not going to use the word attachment to my, let's say you're experiencing anything, mm -hmm. then we journey with you. We find a way, we find tool, but there is no one way to there is no one proper tool. Okay. And even a tool that you use at one point has to ease out at one point in your life because we need something else because you, you're growing. So what we will do, I will say, no matter what you do, no matter who you work with, it's all about moving into the closer circle of intimacy and that's you and your body. What is the main issue that you find uh, in Mauritius? Anxiety right now. It's all about anxiety. It's about... Anxiety it. about what? Just anxious, anxious about life, anxious about what they're feeling. But it's very interesting because right now I'm having a lot of women and even men writing because they're anxious because they're experiencing stuff. So they want to fix it. Okay. And that's not the way to go. Wanting to fix it is also a trauma response. So what do you want to fix? You can't fix anything. You've had an experience. You can actually pause, integrate that experience, and that's how hard things to do. So what should the person do in this situation? Is there a right way of doing it? There is no right way of doing it. And this is what we need to hear. And this shows up a lot in my circle. When we go through very challenging instances in life and we, we kind of numb parts of us, now we no more have access to that part of us. I will say it's always about meeting that part of you. We call it in my work fragmentation. So you're fragmented deep inside. So for a woman, what it will mean is when you sit in a gathering with other women, you do hard, hard work. It's like I'm gathering back now. All right. That's what the journey of work means. I feel like even you as a yoga teacher understand that. Yes. Walking home, we walk home to this body. We don't walk home anywhere else. Very often we react in a certain way, we feel a certain way, but we don't really know why or what is yeah. happening. Can you... From your point of view as a facilitator, what does that mean? What is happening to us? Yeah. Do you have an answer to this? <laughs> it's interesting because it was in my reflection this week after one of my yoga, morning yoga class. See, I feel what I feel because it is here for me to feel what I'm saying in the simplest way. If you're feeling sadness, feel it. Because in this work that we do, there's nothing about bad emotion or good emotion, wrong emotion or right emotion. It's going through the emotions? It's going through the emotion. Like, I'm feeling sad, mm, feel it. And say it, maybe express it. Even express it. Have people that, you're, that you feel safe around to express it. Now, the thing is that most of us, even when we say, mm, I feel sad, I'm going to feel it, then we have this expectation that after my sadness comes joy. But it doesn't work this way. Because if you're expecting joy afterward, you might be expecting and then your candle is blown off, dead. And nothing okay. comes. Okay. 
So you feel what you feel because it is here for you to feel. And the reason why most of us want to really rush through what we feel, that's also a response of being overwhelmed and traumatized. Because when, when you feel like it's too much for you, it's a sign of wanting to fix it. How do you fix it? They're not, not, and right now I feel this is also the call for the entire world. When you look at the entire whole stage drama, we've, we've lived for maybe the last hundred years in fixing stuff. Okay. We've, we've created products that people never needed. Of course. It's called marketing. Yeah, and we'll keep creating stuff. And all of this is about fixing this sense of disease and discomfort. And discomfort is an integral part of my work. You show up, there is no way you're not going to feel uncomfortable. Okay. Like even right here between you and me, there is this level of comfort and discomfort because you don't know what you're going to ask next and I don't know what you're going to ask next. <laughs> I do know what I'm going to yeah, ask. Yeah, but I don't know what you're going <laughs> to ask next. So I, I'm sitting with it. But at the same time, you don't know what I'm going to say next. So w w what I understand is whatever you're feeling, is, it is okay to go through that feeling, whether it's losing someone, whether it's feeling sad, whether it's happy. It is okay. But we never complain when we feel happy. It's always when it has a negative connotation that uh, it really affects us and we're asking ourselves, yeah. where is life going? What is happening? Yeah. What do we do next? But when we're happy, we never ask those questions. So maybe there's a, there's a point of reflection to be there done there. There is. And I'll, I'll add by saying that maybe for the last 10 years, I don't know if you've noticed this, you yourself in the work that you do, there's this entire drama around positive and positive and positive and almost shaming people who are grieving. Like, you've lost someone. How can you expect to be okay within a month? It's not human. Your relationship ended. How can you not cry for like three, three months or six months? It's like it's in inhuman. So there is this thing that kind of fueling people and people have... I would say many of us around the world have developed this very weird perception and belief. There's a pressure emotion. not to attach to negative connotations. What are emotion? Emotion is energy in movement in your body. We say okay. E, motion, energy in motion. Okay. So an emotion is, not a, is, is nothing intelligent. Okay. It carries information, but it's a somatic experience. What I mean by somatic experience it's something happening there. So if somebody asks me often in my coaching, like she says, like, I'm feeling sad. I'm like, localize your sadness where it is. If it's here somewhere in the body, I'm like, okay, that's a somatic experience. But often when the person says it's here in the head, that's a judgment. So that's a takeaway for anybody listening to us. If you are having some sort of experience and I ask you to localize it, it can't be localized in the body, but it's here. Now that's the judgment happening here. Those kind of trauma that are happening it causes a lot of stress and this is one of the main issues that people are facing nowadays and are finding it very hard to get past. What would be your advice to people in terms of dealing with those situations? It, it's very hard. It is hard. Even harder with the current situation. It is. But we need to hear that in most instances, we're not being, you were not being re-traumatized, you are being triggered. Triggered is literally like there is a button here and then something happened in the external world and the button is pushed on. But we need to know what each means. Stress is not trauma. Stress is literally the very natural and healthy way for the body to respond to any detection of danger in the world. And where there is danger, it means that I'm afraid of something. I'm going to take a simple example. You, you have a little one in your family, you're very close to that child and then a child is walking off near a cliff and then your body, your brain, your brain stem detects danger. Yes. And the body goes into, into a response. That's very healthy. Because if there's, not, there's never this kind of stress, you won't go into healthy performance. So even to be here today, you have, I have had, had a very healthy level of stress, which is managed. So that's stress. Stress is physiological, it's biological. And worry is something else. Worry is there in this head, this part of the brain. Okay. And then anxiety is altogether something else. When worry and anxiety stress come together, we have anxiety. And anxiety is this sense of always, always something bad is going to happen. Mega, you don't only carry out uh, the circles with one-on-one -on -one or with uh, friends or people you know, but your services are also required as a facilitator at the corporate level, yeah. especially with, with people working. Yeah. How is that different? It hit me this month how, how much people are drained and stressed and overwhelmed in the corporate world right now. 
Because at the end of the day, you still have human beings who come with their baggage and history, everything, and they show up for work. And I feel right now, the quality of leadership, the call for the next generation of leadership is going to be a leader who can show up and can be in that space of, I feel you, and I will let you feel, you feel that I'm feeling you. And from that space, you ease out and you calm down, and then we work towards something in common in future. What, what I understand from this is a matter of increasing trust between two people, whether they are at the manager or employee level, is having more trust? It's beyond trust, because trust comes from that space of, I don't know if you realize it so far, each time we've been speaking, you've been going back and forth, and literally our body has been synchronizing. Like, I've been moving back and forth, and you've been doing the same. Yes. So this is what I say, but I feel you, and you feel me feeling you, Okay. And I feel you feeling me feeling you. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. And yeah. this is what we need right now. Not just in corporate world, but in communities and organizations. Because as human beings, we are communal. We can't regulate, we can't manage ourselves on our own unless we learn to manage ourselves in connection, in relationship, in union with others. So if right now somebody is listening to us and they are like, I'm freaking out, I can't do it on my own. Well... Very good. That's a great way to say, don't do it on your own. Never do it on your own. Go and find people out there because they are all safe people to whom to work with. All right. All right. Fantastic. Uh, before ending this interview, Mega, any, any final piece of advice you would like to share with our viewers? When you start that journey of whether you call it self-development, you want to call it spiritual journey, empowerment, or owning your power, know that this is not a journey to rush. Rushing is another sign of trauma. So it takes time. We often say, one of my teachers, he's, he's passed away, he's left his good body, his name is Bert Hellinger. He says that the soul has its own way and own pace to do the movement. So when you're on your journey, if you get frustrated, you get angry, you, wanna, you get fed up, you want to give up, good signs. All of these are good signs. You have these, but know that you can't rush. So take your time. Okay. Take your time to uh, rewire. Self-development is really about my brain was in this size. Now I'm unwiring the ancient wires in my brain and I'm going maybe this. And know this is tough work. So I'm going to say I applaud you. I congratulate you because of what you're doing right now. Even if it's simply breathing every day, because of this act of breathing every day, we're going to have a next generation of children who are going to be very different. Oh, fantastic. I, I like your optimism. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your time and your knowledge with us and uh, the viewers of Encounter. I'm sure they have found it very useful. So uh, I'm sure we'll meet again and all the best on your journey, Mika. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have now come to the end of this episode of Encounter. I hope you have enjoyed it as much as I have. If you have any questions, queries on the topic that was discussed or on the guest, please drop an email. It is encounter at mbc.net.mu. Until the very next episode, goodbye.